Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go live. Hello, um, I'm Victoria with the Auburn Hills Public Library and we're here today with Ashley Turner from um, Oakland Mediation Center. Before we get into some of our questions today, I just wanted to give a couple of announcements about things happening at the library. Um, right now we're in the process of getting ready for our Art in the Hills uh, third annual art show and that will run from September 25th through October 16th. Um, if you are have any interest in art just like to enjoy a little bit of art you can come on down to the library and vote for your favorite pieces um, we do give out a prize for our people's choice award winner and um, we'll have a reception on october 16th to uh, honor some of these winners we've got a few other things going on um, in recognition of some of the art stuff we have a um, couple of dia talks with the detroit institute of arts one of them is about uh, fashion that's vogue and that'll be on, I believe, September 28th. And then I, uh, I'm also working on, actually, I think it's September 25th, I'm sorry. That'll be on September 25th, next Saturday. And then um, on October 5th uh, in the evening, we have another talk with the DIA about Detroit style and the history of the automotive industry um, and car design. So a couple of interesting talks coming up in the adult department. Um, but let's go ahead and get into our talk with Ashley today. Ashley is an attorney on staff at the Oakland Mediation Center and launched the Low Cost Legal Services Program in 2018. Ashley's legal work has been exclusively dedicated to providing access to justice and serving communities and individuals who would otherwise go unrepresented. The Low Cost Legal Services Program provides affordable representation, free clinics, and presentations on legal issues affecting the average individual. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for having me, Victoria. So we had some questions submitted by patrons um, and we'll try to respond to what we can today. Um, I'll just jump right in with the first question that we had. Um, this individual says, my previous employer tracked my location on my personal phone without my knowledge for nine months and located my location when I was called off work and on my days off. They ask, is this legal? Um, so it can and can't be. So privacy is still um, a very gray area of law. Um, and a lot of employers are, are getting smart nowadays when it comes to, you know, downloading applications that clock you in and out of work, um, depending on when you actually arrive at the work location and things like that. So it's difficult to say um, just offhand, is that legal? Um, I'm a little concerned because they are tracking your location when you're off work and your day is off. So it doesn't seem reasonably related um, to your work on the job site. Now, if you're using um, automobiles that are company property or if the phone itself is company property, that's a little bit more, um, you know, would be legal. But since it's your personal phone and you're not actually doing work at that time, uh, I'm leaning a little bit more towards no, but it also depends on do they use any of those applications um, that maybe track uh, your location in them as well. And then they also ask, uh, what does a lawyer cost for a situation like this? Um, so I don't do this kind of work, so I guess it's really up to the attorney that you hire. My gut is telling me that this might be more of a contingent uh, representation agreement where, you know, the outcome and the cost of the representation may be contingent on what the actual outcome of the litigation might be. Um, so, yeah, it might be one of those situations where you so-and-so, you know, split the profits, um, depending on if your side wins. But you have to remember with any type of litigation, even if the attorney's time is contingent, that does not include any fees or costs associated with litigation. So um, I think sometimes people lose sight of not just the cost of the attorney and their time and the work they're putting in, but also court filing fees, motion fees, subpoena costs, depositions, all of that costs are going to be out of pocket costs. And you may not get the recovery that you're looking for. But an attorney experience in this field would be able to guide you on if you know your case would be a positive outcome for you. Thank you. Um, kind of a related question here. How does one get a lawyer? 
Um, so there's lots of ways to get a lawyer. Um, we're all hanging out on every street corner. I kind of feel like sometimes, um, you can go the traditional way, which is, I would say our state bar of Michigan does have a directory of every um, attorney that is actively practicing. You can search by location. You can search by um, areas of practice and who's accepting new clients. So that's a good feature to use the state bar of Michigan member directory, which you can find on their website. I would also say that word of mouth is extremely important. And so talk to trusted friends and trusted individuals who are like-minded to you who may have worked with an attorney in the past. Um, I would say that's where most of our own referrals even come from is from individuals who have had positive experience with us and have recommended us to others. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to try those two different routes. You can also simply Google um, in your location, in your area, and what type of lawyer that you're looking for um, and make sure that you shop around. A lot of law offices offer, also offer consultations and you want to make sure that you ask questions um, to make sure that you're hiring the lawyer that will also be right for you. This might be a good time actually to ask what sort of questions should we ask lawyers before hiring them? I would want an individual to focus on what's important to them. And I think one of the biggest things is often communication. And I think different firms and often different individuals might have different expectations as to what constant communication and proper and reasonable communication looks like. So for me, I always try and get back to my clients within one business day. If it's not going to be within one business day, I try and have another staff member inform them why it won't be in one business day and when I will get back to them. Um, because sometimes attorneys, if we're literally in court all day, um, actually actively get litigated in hearings, we're just not able to get to the phone or to the email as quickly as we would like. Um, but typically we can designate another attorney or another staff member to get back to that client to at least let them know that the message was received and will respond as soon as we're able. Um, you also want to make sure that it's an individual that you trust that if it is something that they need to get back to immediately that they will. Um, and I know that's hard because to everyone, of course, their legal matter is the most important thing that's going on to them right now. It, no matter what type of legal matter it is, it's always extremely stressful and you always want to be able to get information and updates on your case as quickly as possible. So I would say definitely ask about the firm or that individual's communication um, protocols and how long it takes them to get back to you. Um, you I would also ask questions regarding cost and see in what type of experience they have litigating that specific type of matter and how many times they've dealt with that issue. Um, and I would also want you to ask questions um, that may be more, I always think of like job interviews, but they're more behavioral, um, just to kind of get to know the person a little bit to see if you think that you'll work well together. Because you want to remember that even though the attorney is the experienced woman, how to deal uh, litigate, um, you're the one who's still actually hiring them. Um, so they do work for you. And I always encourage people to remember that, um, that the attorney does work for you. But you have to remember and trust that individual because sometimes we may have recommendations on what, how we should move forward with the litigation um, that may not sound right to you as the client. But sometimes you need to be able to trust that person and trust that judgment. So not only do you want to make sure they have experience, you want to make sure that you have the same expectations regarding communication. You want to make sure that you get along and you feel like you can trust this person. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into another patron question here. Um, Anonymous asks, um, they said, I currently have a quick claim deed for my home for my trust, but I want to upgrade to a lady bird quick claim deed so I can protect myself and my trust in this estate assets from Medicaid in the state of Michigan if I ever have to go into a nursing home where they say they'll take almost all your assets if they need it. Can I print and fill out this online trust for myself and have it witnessed and notarized and then replace in my trust in the state documents in order to override my current basic quick claim deed? Thank you. Um, I, I'm a little hesitant to answer it very specifically because depending on who's the administrator of that trust currently and, and what the actual trust says is going to require or how we're able to deed that document from your trust um, back to you, I assume, in the Ladybird, and then back to whoever you want to have it as the remainder. I will confirm that, yes, that is a way to get around um, that asset recovery that Medicaid does have um, after you pass away if you are in a nursing home. Um, that is a Ladybird deed is a way to get around that. Um, but I just want to make sure that whoever is the actual administrator uh, of that trust is able to do that 
act of writing that deed to someone else because it depends trust can be very specific on what you can and cannot do um so i just want to make sure i would recommend and probably consulting with someone just to make sure that the language of the trust does allow you to do that, to deed it back out um, in that manner. Um, but typically there's a lot of online forms um, just to do that, to quit, uh, you know, ladybird deed something to yourself and give the remainder to others. Um, but that is a way to get around that as asset recovery that you're referring to. Okay, we have another question. Um, someone says that they are or that they need assistance with an appeal to a determination with, the, um, with their unemployment insurance agency. Um, they're asking if your agency can assist them or make a referral. So I will say that that's not something that my agency often uh, gets involved with. Um, I believe it is something that we could advise you and help you through, but I think if you're looking more for um, direct representation on this issue or more hands-on assistance, I'd probably recommend Lakeshore Legal Aid because I do know that they do a lot of public benefits work specifically with unemployment. Um, and I do know that is a listed service on their website. So again, I would recommend um, Lakeshore Legal Aid um, in trying their hotline to see if they can provide you assistance on that. Yeah, and I do know um, at the library, you know, we don't provide any um, legal advice, but we do provide some reference assistance. So we can always help patrons who come into the library find places that can serve them and offer them advice. Um, okay, we have another question. They're asking the process for legally changing your first name. They write, my mother detests her given first name and uses her middle name as her first um, and is used on bank accounts, pension, social security, Medicare, supplements, insurances, living trust, et cetera. So thankfully, I won't say the process is easy, but thankfully in Michigan, we do have a good way to conduct a name change. So you would actually file a petition to have your name changed in the proper circuit court based on where you're living. So fortunately in Michigan, we have michiganlegalhelp.org which is a website that you can visit to actually help you do this exact thing. So if you go to michiganlegalhelp.org and you say, I want to change my name, it'll take you right to that article about how name change petitions work. And then it also has a do-it-yourself tool that will actually walk you through how to fill out the forms They'll fill out the forms for you. And then there'll also be instructions with those forms on how to file it, how many copies you need, where to take them, which is honestly the biggest pain in all of it, right? Um, I wish they had those for attorneys because sometimes I'm always wondering how many copies do I need? Where do they all need to go? MichiganLegalHelp.org will help you do that. There also is, I believe you have to conduct a background check um, as a part of applying for that petition for the name change. And then of course, you'll have to go to a hearing. Um, the hearing is, it is a formal hearing, um, but I will say that name changes are something that are extremely common. And what they're really looking for is making sure that you're not doing this name change for a fraudulent purpose, whether it's criminal or whether it's to defraud creditors. They want to make sure that you're doing the name change for the right reason. And I tell you, it is very frequently that I've seen um, individuals go up there and say, Judge, I just, I just don't like my name. I don't like it. Um, and they will grant the name change as long as there's no other um, extenuating factors. Um, moving into another patron question here, um, they write, a municipality has set back for buildings and parking lots for non-residential entities, and yet several employees park less than a foot from residential fencing. The lot is not full, nor are they handicapped, but they grant themselves this privilege. Is it not implied from the setback that this should not occur? Oh, I mean, so we're talking about zoning ordinances right which i don't think any of us understand uh attorney or non-attorney understand uh the code of ordinances and zoning ordinances but um, I would say that it depends on when this parking lot was constructed, if it's grandfathered in in some way. Typically, yes, there are setback rules, even um, for parking lots in highly populated areas. I don't know why I'm visualizing places like downtown Royal Oak or things like that when I when I visualize this scenario. Um, so I can imagine we're working with, but I do know um, in some zoning codes, I've actually seen where the setback is different if there is a fence um, between the properties or some type of barrier um, that the setback can actually be a lot less. Um, so I would encourage this person to actually look at the zoning code and look at parking lots um, as well as when that exact code was probably enacted based on when the parking lot might be there and also if there's any differences in regards to fencing. Um, if there's a fence constructed or any type of barrier constructed, sometimes the setback can be less. 
Thank you. I appreciate you. We're, we're jumping all over the place today. All sorts of different. We are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people, people are all over the board. Um, but I want to get into just kind of some general, more general questions um, that I hear a lot. Um, so we'll start off with, I know you, you got a little bit into talking about the cost of hiring a lawyer in, in one situation, but kind of talking overall, what are the costs associated with hiring a lawyer? The cost can definitely range. So, um, so typically most attorneys um, bill out their time on an hourly basis. So they charge X number of dollars an hour. Um, also, the way attorneys bill time is typically in six minute increments. So no matter what we do, it's six minutes. So even if, and I'm not saying that everybody does it this way, but say if we're typing up an email and it only took us three minutes, they still charge six minutes. So we always bill our time in six minute increments. Um, so that's why I always, I always tell my clients personally, if you send me emails, you want to make sure you include all of your questions that you you can think of in one email and then I can sit down and take time to reply back. So, and I know you're going to have more questions to follow up, but you want to really try and be concise when you're speaking with your attorney and get all your questions and all your issues out of the forefront to kind of save you more time, I think in the long run and expense in the long run when you're communicating with your attorney. I also try and remind clients too, when you're in a consultation or you're in a meeting with your attorney, remember that they will ask the questions that they need answers for. And sometimes there's a lot of information information that maybe the client thinks that's important that may not be. And you want to let your attorney guide the question because not only does that save time, but it saves you money. So typically most attorneys bill at an hourly rate, um, unless we're talking about some of those contingent agreements, right, where their pay is maybe based on the outcome of the case, but you still want to keep an eye on costs and filing fees and any other litigation fees that might be associated with the case. I have to say right now, um, I do think that retainers are somewhat relatively high where just to engage with an attorney to cost maybe a few thousand dollars down and then they start billing at that at their hourly rate. Um, that's something that we try and, and keep mind of here at Oakland Mediation Center with our legal services program as we try and keep the retainers low so it's manageable. And we also try and offer out of the box services. So something that the state of Michigan actually started doing a few years ago was allowing limited scope representation. So attorneys can now offer limited scope services. So instead of providing direct full representation on a case, which may be more expensive and not conducive to the client, we can sort of hop in and out and help you on the pieces that you need help with. So sometimes I have clients that just come from come to me for advice and then they actually manage the case themselves. Some clients come to me to have them draft their documents for filing for them and tell them how to file and then they're off doing it on their own. And then some clients, you know, they do need direct and full representation. So we do that too. So there's um, creative ways that you can kind of keep costs down, I will say. Okay, thank you. And can you speak a little bit to, um, I know as we've kind of gone through, there's there's a lot of different topics in the legal field. Uh, what kind of different lawyers are out there? Oh, I mean, every little thing that you can think of, um, we can litigate, right? So there's people that just specialize in everything. Um, obviously, the most common that we see the billboards for, right, personal injury, car accident. Um, I think those are the ones too that sometimes are commonly common contingent type. Um, you've got general practitioners, just like you have doctors, you have general practitioner lawyers. And that's why sometimes, um, you know, we hate going to parties or things as people will ask, well, such and such and such, is that legal? There are so many laws, so much case law, so much knowledge that we just can't keep it all in our heads. And we literally research every little thing that comes across our desk to make sure that we're giving you the proper advice. We just can't keep it all in there. Um, so there's attorneys that specialize in everything. I think, you know, some of the more interesting ones might be sports law or entertainment law, environmental law. Um, there's attorneys that specialize in immigration, um, attorneys that specialize in just family law. Uh, there's just everything that you could think of, they're out there. Thank you. Where do you guys kind of fall into that? Okay, so I would consider us to be general practitioners. Um, and that more so comes from our view is that I don't like to turn people away um, because sometimes people don't know what their issue is and where their problem actually falls. You know, they think they might need um, a good example is they maybe they think that they need to establish paternity, but what they actually 
need right now is guardianship of a minor, and then we can look forward and see what the long-term solution to their problem might be. Um, and that's where consulting with different attorneys can kind of help you figure out where you need to be. Um, but I would say we fall under general practitioners, but a lot of our work is going to be in housing and real estate. A lot of our work is in family law. Um, and we do find some of our work too in, you know, probate guardianship and estate planning as well. Okay. Well, so let's get into uh, some of the, um, I guess, more detailed questions about that. I know uh, criminal defense lawyers are, of course, popular too. It doesn't seem like something you guys do a ton of, but um, do you know at what point during an investigation a person might consider contacting a criminal defense lawyer? Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why we don't get into criminal defense um, would just be because there is that court appointed option already out there for folks. Um, and a lot of those individuals are, are great attorneys. So um, that's probably why we don't really get into that. But um, if there if there comes a point where there is an investigation, at that point, you call a criminal defense attorney. Um, that's, I think, my answer to that question. Um, if you get at any point where you get in, in just in any trouble, um, you can always, you know, say, nope, I want to speak to an attorney and, and they have to wait and they have to, you know, talk to attorney. I think maybe that's the, that's the part that I want to educate on. Um, <laughs> so as soon as you start getting questioned, feel free to say, I want to speak to an attorney. Um, and it's no... Um, you know, no knock on, um, you know, investigators, police officers, anything like that. Um, but I think some of them are so um, easy to talk to sometimes um, that I just want to make sure that individuals know that you can always say, nope, I want to speak to my attorney. Nope, I want to speak to my attorney. Um, do you think, though, if, um, if an officer asks you to identify yourself and provide identification, that that is uh, not the time to call a lawyer and just to provide um, your name and identification? <laughs> not those types of questions that I'm referring to. <laughs> All right, and then moving into, I know some of the housing stuff is a, a hot topic right now. Um, do you have any advice um, for renters who may be facing evictions now that the Michigan eviction moratorium has lifted? Yes, so my biggest advice for one, for folks who are facing eviction, one is that there's still funds out there. So if you have not applied for any um, rental relief funds, please do that. The program that's running right now, um, Sarah, C-E-R-A, um, is my understanding in all three counties that there are still funds available. When I say all three counties, I mean Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb, um, that there are still funds available. So please make sure that you do that first. Um, also, um, reach out to either Oakland Mediation Center, uh, Lakeshore Legal Aid, or Legal Aid and Defenders in Detroit um, if you are facing an eviction because we do have funding and services to provide legal advice for folks who are facing eviction. Now, some of the more common things that I see besides being a hot behind on rental assistance um, is issues with repairs. And um, I think it is important to set fair expectations when it comes to repairs and what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. I often refer clients to, um, there's actually a handbook online, uh, the Michigan Landlord Tenant Handbook. You can Google it, it pops right up. It's a PDF document. And it will talk about um, what repairs the courts kind of consider minor, what repairs courts consider major, and what repairs they consider nuisance. Um, so small issues, right? And I often find that what people think is large and big is not what the courts tend to think to be large and big. And you also want to make sure you understand your responsibilities as a tenant what you're required to repair and what you're required to maintain and also what you need to do to notify your landlord or property management that you're having a problem. And I'm sorry, Victoria, I'm kind of veering off, but this is something I feel like I'm getting a lot lately. Um, you want to make sure you make those repair requests in writing. Um, I often get a lot of, well, I went down to the office and I told them, that's great, but no, can we put it in writing, please? Can we send a formal letter? Can we fill out some form that maybe the property management provides? Um, we need to get it in writing and we need to make sure that we record everything that we're doing when we're requesting those repairs. Now, if we're getting to the point where they're still not doing the repairs, what you can do is you, and the handbook also explains this as well in a little bit more detail, what you can do is you can make those repairs and then keep all the receipts and then deduct it from the rent. Um, so if it's something that you think that the landlord is responsible for, you can make those minor repairs yourself and you can deduct them from the rent and make sure you keep copies of those receipts. Now, if it gets to the point where the landlord has violated um, their requirement to keep the premises habitable, um, 
your options at that point, you could withhold rent if it's considered a major extreme problem, but you wanna make sure you always hold your rent in escrow. So that way, if you are facing eviction because there's a dispute over repairs, you can tell the judge, hey judge, I am ready and prepared to pay rent. Here it is in escrow. However, the landlord has not held up their side. Um, so you wanna make sure that you do that as well. Cause you can't just say I've got, you know, a leaky faucet and so I withheld my rent for a couple months. That's, it's, it's not gonna fly. And I've seen people try to do it. Please don't do that. What I also wanna make sure that people understand is that if you are on a month to month tenancy, the landlord can evict you and decide not to renew the next month. So I've seen this kind of come up a lot where individuals are on a month to month tenancy and then are quite shocked when they get um, a demand for them to move at the end of the 30 days with proper notice. Um, and I wanna make sure that individuals understand that if you are on a month to month, the landlord can ask you to leave they can decide to terminate the tenancy. And that is different than being sued or evicted for non-payment of rent. If you are in a month to month, they can ask you to leave. Um, and they don't need to provide a reason to do that. They can just decide to terminate the lease if you're on a month to month. And I think um, one of the things that I've seen is kind of the surprise, um, because I've seen um, you know, some real estate attorneys using termination of tenancy versus non-payment of rent to try and evict um, you know, tenants during this eviction moratorium. And I we struggled with finding defenses for that because at any time they can terminate the lease, right? They don't have to have a reason if you're on a month to month and they provide proper notice. Um, there are defenses to that, right? Like retaliatory eviction or things like that. But I just wanna make sure individuals know when you're on a month to month, you do run that risk that if they provide proper notice, they could ask you, at, you know, to leave and terminate the tenancy. Thank you, yeah. Um, we'll move into an, another side of um, sort of housing and estate. Um, when should I start estate planning? Um, it's never too early to start. And I think people kind of laugh when I say that sometimes because I think it sounds a little bit cliche of, you know, you you know, of course, I'm an attorney, I want to charge you to do your estate plan, I'm going to say do it now so I can change it a few times between now and later. Um, that's not true. Um, estate planning is not so much for yourself as it is for other people. Um, so especially if I, you know, with younger individuals, they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm young, I don't really need estate planning. You know, if something does happen to you, do you really want your parents to have to go through, you um, probably a folder of hodgepodge documents and receipts and try and figure out what to do with maybe the assets that you had. No, you wanna try and get things in place when you think about it, um, especially if you have any assets, right? Like cars or house, things like that. And I know sometimes people are thinking, well, you know, maybe when we have kids, we'll do it. No, you really need to do it before. You wanna have those things in place um, before you really start expanding in your life, right? Because you don't want to leave your loved ones with the difficulty of trying to manage your estate and get things where they need to be. Um, also, when you think about estate planning, it's not just whether you have assets or not and where they're going to go. Um, something that's even more common, right, is those power of attorneys or those medical directives. I think that those are even more important than where your assets are going to go and, you know, who's going to get them, right? In case something happens to you, you want to make sure that there's a backup plan, right? That you have someone who's already designated to help you with your assets, or you already have someone designated to make those medical decisions. And you can designate more than one person. You can break up their power making authority if you're worried that they won't be able to make decisions together. I think what I also like too about medical directives and having those in place early on is it gives your loved ones the comfort that they're doing what you wanted them to do. So you can make those quite detailed in terms of what your wishes are and what your wishes are not. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, would you want to be on, you know, life supporting equipment? Do you want a feeding tube? People sometimes get very detailed with their medical directives. And I think it actually gives their loved ones some comfort. So when they do have to make those decisions, they feel prepared and they feel comforted knowing that this is what their loved one wanted done. Okay, well, um, kind of moving into family. So we'll talk about some family um, questions here. What are the uh, legal grounds for obtaining a divorce? Oh, and see, now I hope my family law professor isn't watching because uh, he's going to be mad that I can't restate this uh, answer from memory. But um, 
it's not necessary to plead um, whether there's fault or not in Michigan to obtain a divorce. So Michigan is a no fault state when it comes to actually obtaining a divorce. Now, if we talk about property, that's a different discussion, but to actually obtain a divorce, you can just ask for one. Um, there has to be, you have to plead a very simple statement saying that there's been a breakdown in the marriage, that there's no likelihood that the bounds of matrimony can be restored. I'm missing a couple words in that statement. So hopefully my professor is not watching. Um, but that's the simple statement that you need to plead. And again, michiganlegalhelp.org has do-it-yourself tools for filing for divorce with and without minor children and will help you make those documents, print them out and give you the instructions on how to file. Um, but that's all you need to obtain a divorce uh, in Michigan. Just a very simple statement. Now, going through the actual legal process and getting the documents filed and getting the divorce finalized is, is another discussion. Um, but again, michiganlegalhelp.org has a lot of that information, a lot of those do yourself tools to get that done, but you don't have to prove anything besides that you don't want to be married to that other person. Okay. And kind of related here, um, I guess, how do the courts determine who gets custody of a child in divorce? Yeah. So the court's going to look at the 12 best interest factors. So who the child looks to for love and affection, um, who provides that moral support, um, whether there's been any domestic violence between the parties. There's all these different factors that the court's going to look at and has to make findings on each one to determine custody and parenting time as well. Um, the best interest factors are I would say the, the exclusive determination of, of who gets custody in a child's divorce. Um, typically, too, if there's a disagreement on how child custody should look um, in the course of the case, the judge may make, a, may make a referral to the front of the court for them to do an investigation and provide a recommendation. And that front of the court officer will go through those same factors, interview the parties to determine where, you know, what child custody may be appropriate in, in this case. Um, I would say right in Michigan that right now it's, I would say that joint custody is the default, right? Unless there's reasons why there should be sole custody. Um, there's also that issue of physical custody and legal custody. Those are two different concepts as well. Those can be sole or joint. They don't have to be exclusive of each other. It could be one parent has sole physical custody, but they both have joint legal custody. And you want to make sure that you understand what those two different types of custody means. Um, I get a lot of folks who sometimes fight over physical custody, which doesn't always make sense to me because what they're really fighting about is parenting time. Um, and parenting time is always modifiable as is custody, as is child support. So even if you reach a final agreement in divorce, those legal constructs are always modifiable in regards to the minor children because the, the court will always modify them if it's in the children's best interest to do so. Um, so that's no question. But if you already have a custody or parenting time arrangement and you wanna ask for a modification, that's where things can get a little bit more complex because if the modification that you're asking for will alter the established custodial environment, um, then you have a higher burden of proof to prove that it's in the children's best interest to modify that order. Um, so I just wanna make sure that individuals know that you can modify a custody order, but you know, it can be difficult depending on if you're gonna alter that established uh, custodial environment. Okay. Kind of a, a question underneath this category, a little more specific. I know right now um, there's lots of issues surrounding vaccinations. Um, what would you recommend for parents with shared custody who disagree with their co-parents about whether to vaccinate their child? Yeah, this is a hot topic. Um, so you're asking what would I recommend for, so if I had a client come to me and say that they had shared custody and they disagree with the other parent on whether to vaccinate their child. So if they have joint legal custody, that means they have to agree on medical decisions regarding the minor child. If they don't have joint legal custody and they have sole legal custody, well then it depends who has sole legal custody and then they get, they're free to make that decision regarding the vaccine. So if I have a client come to me and they have joint legal custody and they disagree on the vaccination issue, then obviously they're going to have to bring that dispute to the court. Someone's gonna to have to file a motion to say whether they want the child not to be vaccinated or to be vaccinated. And that is going to be a very judge dependent decision. So you'd wanna make sure that you're working with an attorney who's familiar with that court or familiar with that judge or potentially even familiar with their front of the court staff because the judge may refer that issue to the front of the court to see 
how they might come out or how maybe they've already been coming out on that issue of vaccination. Because even prior to COVID-19, vaccinations were an issue that were sometimes before the court. My gut tells me, and I would tell a client this, that a court would order that the child be vaccinated if the parties disagree and there's joint custody. That's what my gut tells me, unless they're extenuating circumstances that we're dealing with a child that is you know, compromised, has some other factors where maybe even um, experts have weighed in or the child's doctor has weighed in to say, maybe it's not appropriate for this child to be vaccinated right now. That would, I say, the only thing that could maybe build a case um, to, to say maybe the child shouldn't be vaccinated if there's some other extenuating circumstances and we have other professionals saying, no, we should wait for whatever reason. Okay. Thank you. I know that's that's kind of a trending thing right that's now. A, that's um, a tough question, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll move into some more um, general topics. How can I determine whether I have enough of a case to take someone to court? Oh, I would just schedule consultations with attorneys. So if you have um, an issue um, that you think, you, you know, you might have a case or you don't have a case, um, especially so if it's a type that most attorneys take on contingency, they'll be very upfront with you if they think that you do or don't have a case. Now, sometimes that there's certain, you know, civil rights issues that maybe attorneys may not be as interested in where it's definitely a lot of work up front and we may not have a lot of gain at the end. But there are um, civil rights attorneys and civil rights organizations that will take up these types of issues. Um, I would also say organizations like ours are also looking for issues that lean more towards systemic advocacy. So if we see a lot of small wrong things happening to a lot of people in a similar, similar situation, um, you know, you want to bring those to larger agencies because there might be something that we can do about it. If we have enough plaintiffs maybe to bring a case where we have this small issue, but it's affecting so many, um, that's something that maybe a larger organization can help with. So if you're not having any luck in the private attorney sector, I would encourage you too to talk to other organizations to see if they might have clients with similar issues and we might be able to do something about it. Um, so I would say I would always take it to an attorney to, to make that you know, to make that call. But I also do get a lot of individuals who say, hey, like I do have a case against someone for maybe like a few thousand dollars. And that's where we really have to get into the discussion of the cost of litigation. And that's not even the cost to judgment, right? The filings and the, the cost to get to judgment. And then we have to actually try and collect from this person too. Um, so it's not just getting a judgment. It's not just winning the case. Now we're talking about collections and we're talking about garnishments. And that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, this one's a little more uh, situational, but what should I do after I'm injured in an accident for which someone else is at fault? Okay. Call 911. Um, if we didn't do that yet, then you call the insurance company. I think that's the order and you do things. Call 911, call the insurance company, then call an attorney, right? Um, I think it is somewhat fair when you see those billboards of right that the insurance companies aren't necessarily working for you, right? Um, even like an attorney that's representing the insurance company, right? They don't necessarily represent you. Um, so you do want to make sure that maybe you get your own legal counsel in this type of situation. And there's definitely a lot of them out there that practice in this area. And again, I think they're, they're also very helpful when it comes to do I have a case? Do I not have a case? Um, a lot of them can be very helpful in that aspect too. But if you're injured, call 911, then call the insurance, then call an attorney. <laughs> I know you kind of have to be careful about what you say in that situation as well. Yes, but I actually think the insurance companies do a very good job of that. I believe most insurance cards say, do not admit fault. <laughs> do not talk. Um. <laughs> right. All right. Well, we're on to kind of our last question here. I'm not really seeing comments pop up. So um, we can yeah. move into, um, I know you work for Oakland Mediation Center. Um, yeah. For what situations would you recommend that someone seek mediation? You know, I was actually thinking this when we were talking about the question with the parking. So I have a feeling we're dealing with an individual who, um, you, you know, probably lives close to some sort of public parking, business parking. Um, this would actually be a perfect case for mediation if they're having issues with specific employees or specific business um, parking close to their home. Um, I think neighborhood disputes are one of the one of the common types of mediation that we get sometimes, um, especially because the courts will sometimes get requests for, for PPOs between neighbors. 
And a PPO between next door neighbors is just not something that's realistic um, to be enforced, you know, to stay 200, 300 feet away from each other when you live next door is not easy. Um, and typically that's a situation where mediation would be appropriate because um, there's obviously something else going on. There's a relationship that needs to be repaired. Nobody, it sounds like nobody's moving anytime soon. Um, mediation and thinking about how we're going to work together going forward would be something that's extremely helpful. In terms of the types of mediations that we do at Oakland Mediation Center, I mean, frankly, uh, we do it all. So we do a lot of mediations actually on site, on site, used to. Now <laughs> we're doing them virtually. Uh, we do all our mediations virtually currently, um, but we're doing them through the district courts. We provide mediation services for their civil divisions as well as their landlord tenant cases and their small claim cases all throughout Oakland County. We also get referrals from some district courts as well. We get referrals from the circuit court on a lot of different matters. So different civil case types, general civil cases. We get PPO mediations, like I said, neighborhood disputes I talked about. We also get a lot of family law referrals too, so family mediation. So a lot of divorce mediation, also a lot of custody and parenting time issues. So that issue of, you know, vaccine or not, they might actually send that to mediation through us first before uh, rendering a decision to see if they're able to reach an agreement. Um, we also get a lot of co-parenting issues. So not just parenting time, but who's going to, you know, what extra clickers are the child going to do? Who's going to be responsible for paying for those extra there's a lot of issues that come up throughout a child's life as they grow besides custody and parenting time that parents need to talk about and we can provide that safe place for them to do it and we're also objective right that's our role as the mediator we're there to help them have a conversation and we have the skills and communication to help work them through their issues there are steps that we follow um, but we also are objective and we don't provide an opinion. So it makes it, I think, a safer place sometimes than having that discussion in court or litigating it in front of a referee or a judge. Um, other types of cases that we do are like guardianship and probate. So when you think of guardianship cases or probate cases, right, we have mom or dad at the center of the case and we've got multiple siblings. We've got siblings with their spouses. Maybe we have, you know, mom and dad siblings too. There's a lot of people. Um, and so we have the different spaces in terms of size and talent in order to have those types of mediations where we have so many different personalities and so many different opinions. And we refocus them all to why they're all really there, right? Mom and dad's future and mom and dad's care. Um, so that's some of the different services that we can provide in terms of mediation and some of the different case types that we see. Um, some of the other things that we do too is actually facilitate and mediate between parents and schools um, regarding their child's special education services that they receive. So we might facilitate IEP meetings. Um, we might mediate a dispute between a parents and schools regarding their child's services that we're re they're receiving. And sometimes, oddly enough, we get called in to facilitate um, large business meetings or uh, large group gatherings because we help provide that organization and that streamlined communication to help those meetings run effectively. So there's really not too any areas that I can think of where mediation or facilitation isn't helpful or isn't appropriate. And I think that comes out too in our own practice as attorneys from Oakland Mediation Center, that that's always where we look to, right? How can we resolve this um, in a way that works best for all the parties? Because sometimes when there's a winner at the end of that litigation, you know, no one ne necessarily wins, um, especially when we're dealing with family and, and probate or school cases. Um, that's where you really need to have that collaborative environment because you really want to restore that relationship. All right. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate that background and uh, a little bit more information about your center too and what you guys do there. Um, I do want to remind people just before we take off here that, um, again, the library does not offer legal advice, um, but we can help you find people who do. Um, Again, as Ashley mentioned, the um, michiganlegalhealth.org is a wonderful resource. Um, through the library, we also have access to the Michigan e-library, which provides a variety of e-resources. And so anyone with a library card in Michigan has access to the Legal Information Reference Center, which includes um, over 12,000 state-specific legal forms by topic. Um, so if you're looking for a particular form, that's something that we can help you locate. We also have access to a variety of um, publications by, um, I know NOLO is the big one. Um, so reference materials, we can help you locate those through our library as well. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. And um, I appreciate your time again, Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.